Welcome back to Eat Tea with GOTB. From Brighton to Barca, from the Emirates to the Dripping Pan. Three competitions, two girls, one weekend. Let's get into it. I'm Rachel. I'm Sophie. And this is Extra Time with Girls on the Ball. Slightly later episode today, so we tried to use uh, much of yesterday to catch up on the games that we had missed during the weekend because we were in Barcelona for that Champions League semi-final and then today we've had a bit of a mad one as well we've been out for 12 hours up in Manchester again yep our second home our second home at the moment that's for sure yes. basically <laughs> but in today's episode we will be looking back at Chelsea's heroics in Barcelona but it is only half time guys um, all the WSL action spread over a whole week uh, the wrap up of an exciting Barclays Championship, and of course, of so your highlight of the week. If I can remember one. Yes, try. It feels like last year already. So, you know. <laughs> so obviously, everyone is talking about and starting with Barcelona versus Chelsea, Chelsea at the Stadio Olimpico. So, of course, we are going to start with the WSL. Uh, let's go all the way back. Cast your mind, self, to the WSL if you can. Chelsea 3, Aston Villa 0. That happened last week like ages ago Brighton 1 um, Everton 2 Karen Holmgaard Tatiana Pinto Gero Bergsland that was an own goal we try not to say that uh, Bristol City 0 Liverpool 1 Murray holding her with the goal there Manchester United 2 Tottenham 2 Mallard Spence Naz and Letizia getting the goals Arsenal 3 Leicester City 0 Beth Mead with 2 and Alessio Russo with 3rd and then Manchester City 5 West Ham 0 Leila Uhabi Bunny Shaw with 2 Laura Blinkilda Brown and Jess Park. So rewind to almost a week ago. Yep. Chelsea three, Aston Villa nil. We were there. Um, crazy game. Probably the worst start Aston Villa could possibly <laughs> hope for. Getting their goalkeeper Annalise sent off in the fourth minute. Fifth minute. I fifth think it was. minute. Um, and having to bring on poor Sophie Poor Poor and um, Sophia Poor Sophia Poor for her first WSL game. And what a game it was to come into. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a bit of a mountain to climb to do. <laughs> when that happens, they had to sacrifice Ebony Salmon, I think, um, for Sophia Poor. And uh, yeah, you just kind of, you were immediately on the back foot, I would say. But I think they did pretty well in, in the way that they, you know, I think you probably expect them always to lose at that point. But they didn't like fall apart. And I think yeah. that will be the positive thing that Carla Ward would take from that performance. They, did dig in. They were gritty. They uh, got the job done in certain aspects of the field, I think. And I think they did threaten at times. You know, when Kirsty Hansen came on, she's been out through injury for quite a long, long time now. I think the last time we saw her was at the Conti Cup semi-final against Arsenal. So she's been out and she came back and she forced Hannah Hampton into a couple of saves. And maybe she'd been a bit, you know, more uh, match fit would have probably put them in different areas of the goal. So... They had chances, so they can take positives from that. But that doesn't take away from Chelsea's kind of performance. Emma Hayes running changes. I think she had to. She knew she had to rotate from that kind of semi-final disappointment and then also with having Barcelona three days later. Yeah. Um, she she had to make sure that people were fresh and tried different things. And so she gave a first start to Macario and to Michael Hermano. Um, and, yeah, I think it was just a way that we've seen Emma Hayes being able to utilise the players in her squad and being, you know, willing to do that and not, she's done it throughout the season where she's been willing to try and build minutes into legs so that in the moments like these where injuries happen or people are tired, they can come in slightly fresher than they would be if they'd been sat on the bench all season. Yeah, so Hamano did get her first goal in a Chelsea shirt, turned home and Ashley Lawrence cross. We also saw uh, Aki Beaver jones with a, a lovely volley um, Go watch that goal because yeah. it was absolutely a sublime finish. Lovely goal. And then Buchanan got the third. Somewhat fortuitously, um, Macario's corner kind of came off the back of her head. There was a bit of a ricochet and it, it bounced in off the goal off the back of her head. So she will absolutely take that one. But as you said, I think Carla Ward can be relatively pleased with, I mean, even if she'd had that full squad and they lost 3-0 compared to the previous fi six, um, reverse fixtures, 6-0, it is an improvement. But actually, I think Emma Hayes has said this before, it's often harder to play against a team that are down to 10 because... Yeah. I mean, they, they sacrifice the strikers and yeah. so they're going to bank up and it's hard to get through. I think the main thing for Emma Hayes was that they won. They levelled on points with City. They went to the top of the table because of the goal difference. They scored three goals. It took them into that kind of positive goal difference over City. And it kind of just went, oh, OK, over to you, City. I know you're going to have the game in hand again. 
but you have to do the job now and then we'll see you in two weeks in 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 terms of us getting back to our WSL action and we, what, we what can, fun it is. We can now focus on the Champions League for the next ten days. Yes, absolutely. And she got was able to rest players as well, which was really key. Um then you were there at the Amex on Friday night. We had Brighton one, Everton two. A very boring first half. Let's just be frank about it. But I will be honest with you. I was sitting there and I was like, because I had that joy of when you went to the Conti Cup final. I had the joy of going to West Ham to watch West Ham Brighton. Probably the most boring game of my life. And in that first half, I was going, not again. Like, why do I do this to myself? <laughs> I'm sat here. It's freezing, even though it's the South Coast and it's some like April. Absolutely shivering. To the on a Friday night. On a Friday night, I got stuck in traffic. I was not in the best mood. A very early flight this morning. And they did not deliver in the first half. But I can say that I'm so glad that they did in the second half. It became a really entertaining game. Yes, there were both keepers made saves in the first half. We've got to give them that. But it was very transitional, entertaining second half. Uh, Sarah and Karen Holmgaard, the twins, linked up telepathic um, for the first goal five minutes after Karen came on, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's they've like Brian Sorensen's been unable to put them on the same pitch very often this season either one or both of them have been injured and they haven't quite been able to show that kind of gelling that they that they can do but I think you saw it straight away and it was interesting like even with uh, Everton's second goal it was from a direct ball over the top from defence um, and for the first one Karen Homgard held it up and she sort of spotted her sister out on the left and then she instinctively knew where that ball was coming into from her sister into the far post. And so she uh, made the run to follow the run in to make the header. And I think it's that kind of, even though they've been out for so long. Twin telepathy. It was that natural instinct of having, you know, grown up together, played yeah. with each other. And I, I think that really helps in those circumstances. So Everton got the first goal. Brighton equalised almost instantly. Um, Simons with a free kick rebounded off the underside of the crossbar and Pinto turned it home um, Courtney Brazza maybe have done better with that maybe I think I think she was just taken aback by the ricochet off the bar um, I did speak to Maisie after the game and she was like was it like was it really Tatiana's goal kind of thing and I was like yeah I think it Sorry. was <laughs> it bounced. she said I thought it bounced in and I was like no I think it bounced the other side of the line and then she, she reacted quickest but it was a superb strike from Macy Simons. Like, seriously, really, really well struck. And I actually had a, like, you know, sometimes you have one of those feelings when you're watching football and you sort of know what's going to happen before it's going to happen. And it was in such a good position mm. for her. And I was like, I just have a, have a feeling this is going to be a goal. Um, well, then Everton scored again. This is a bit more calamitous. Gali ran onto the Van Havenmaar ball forward, beat Carabali, got felled by Bagley, but Bergman then turned it into her own net. Um, it should have been a penalty anyway, I think. So the yeah. fact that <laughs> I also I spoke to Yaya after the game as well, and she said, because um, I kind of asked him, what did you think of the like the goal? And she was like, well, I went down looking for the penalty. <laughs> I thought it was a penalty, but then it was suddenly in the back of the net. Um, but it was a, a run we don't maybe see so often from her this season because yeah. she's been playing right back. She played in midfield for this game, and it allowed her to really. Um, get a, a good stamp on, on the game and kind of make her mark and she made a driving run off, off that football from Van Haven March and yeah she, she just showed her quality and yes it would have been a penalty if it hadn't been a goal. 5,000 at the MX and um, that result also moves Everton up to ninth and Brian Sorensen had also just recently signed what a two-year deal yeah so uh, he is staying it'll be interesting to see what players stick around what they're able to do next season because I think if they can get through this season together Hopefully next season they can flourish. Yeah, and he said like he had his eye on the last at that point in time. It's four games of the season. Brighton was a winnable game. Arsenal next is going to be tough, but then there's two more winnable games. And if they can get six points from those two, and you know Arsenal's a free hit and whatever happens happens, I think he can be quite satisfied with the way that his season is ending and can really build into the next year. Absolutely. Um, then we had on the Saturday, while we were in Barcelona, uh, Bristol City nil, Liverpool won. Didn't sound like the most exciting game. Um, mistakes at the back. It's all Liverpool able to apply the pressure early on, which is something that's been frustrating with Bristol, is those slip-ups at the back. Um, their press was obviously very good, putting them under pressure. Um, but it was uh, Currens who cut back to Hobinger and a, a really good finish. Yeah, it was, I think... She had she started the season so well, Murray, 
and then she sort of went off the ball a bit or maybe lost a bit of the form that she has. But I think in, yeah, well, from that, that strike on, on Saturday, it shows the quality that she has. And I think with a season under her belt in WSL football, I think uh, Liverpool have a, a good gem on their mm-hmm. hands coming into next year and how she can build into that. Re- yeah, really instinctive drill finish. There's no stopping that. I think Bristol City were... The problem for Bristol is they knew that they had to get something out of this game. So they were trying to push... And that just led to a few mistakes in really dangerous areas. Um, and they did, at times in the game, they pushed forward. And um, I think it was Seth Drop who had a really good chance. I think she hit the bar or something. Um, I might be making that up. But I, 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 they, like, there was there was a couple of good chances, but they didn't really create enough. Only two on target. Yeah, to be really troubling Liverpool. And it puts them in a real dire situation. Yeah, I mean, look, it's going to be tough. When they lost that game to West Ham, it was very much like every game's a cup game and it must be pretty exhausting to have to go out and play every game like that. Um, and I think it's kind of coming, it's showing now towards the end of the season. They're seven points off West Ham with three games to play. They have to get a result against City at the weekend of all teams. Yeah. If they don't get a result, they are relegated. It does. It's, it's, it's really sad and not to put the, I don't know, to close them out quite yet, but it, you know they've got if they don't if they get something against Manchester City next week, then they've got Chelsea the week after, and it's just going to be a super tough run in. And I think the one thing I'll say is they have really competed this season. Yeah, and that's I think what makes it a bit harder is that you look at some of the results that didn't end up going their way, and they will be kicking themselves for those because they had moments in games. Yeah where they could have got results and it was those moments it's not this game against City and it wasn't this game against Liverpool that has kind of messed it up for them Mm -hmm. it's the games like the Brighton game where they pulled it back and then they lost 7-3 and you know yeah I think it's it's going to be a hard end of season for them but Lauren Smith said she was in in pre-match she was so proud of the whole of what they've done this season and that you know from the outside we only look at results really but actually They've fielded essentially a team of teenagers at times. You know, they're given so many young players chances. To a lot play of the time, not, by, not be forced to because of injuries. Well, that, but also I think they are, it's an ethos of the club to be yeah. building young players. And, you know, the likes of Mary Ward coming onto the pitch at times and Naomi Lozell, who's, you know, a, a youngster. And, it is part of their values and they want to compete. And that's what Lauren Smith said, but they also need to stick to their values of developing young players and they have to they don't have a big budget so they have to be creative with it um but they they haven't been really heavily run over too many times this season yeah, it's been like kind of the, a few results that haven't gone their way yeah. but they have taken it to teams you know you look at the Manchester United game that result doesn't really reflect how the game when you look at that Arsenal game you know they did kind of as you say compete and I think it's very easy to look at the the table or to look at results and just think oh well of course they're they've come up they're going straight back down but actually they have done a you know a pretty respectable job this season and also I think in terms of what they've done at the club and, ter- and fan engagement and all that kind of stuff as yeah. well they need to be um rewarded like commended for I should say yeah. so hopefully hopefully we'll see them back up again and hopefully they can build on that into the next season the championship absolutely well touching if, on if they are relegated no I mean yeah not not done yet Okay. Um, speaking of Manchester United, they played Tottenham in a rehearsal for the FA Cup final, which both teams hate us talking about, but you can't help but do it. Um, 2-2, really interesting game. I thought England did have an early opportunity over the bar quite early on, but I think Manchester United started the game quite well uh, coming forward. Mallard beat the Spurs defence to head home from an Evans free kick quite early on. Spurs would be really annoyed the way they defended her. She just sort of sauntered through, rose above everyone and headed home. And I think they'll be a bit frustrated about that one. Yeah, they were, of course, playing without Grace Clinton as well, which was another thing they had to contend with. Naz was playing centrally again. um, And I just, I do think Man United had the better start. Mallard pulled another good save um, out of uh, Spencer in goal. So... It was a good start for Man United, but once again, not actually capitalising or producing. Tottenham had their chances as well. And I do think, so uh, Vinberg was in uh, for Grace Clinton, yeah, um, who is, you know, obviously can't play because it's a parents club. So 
I think she performed pretty well and she's had to be quite patient for her time to start. And, you know, these two games, this game against Manchester United and most likely the Cup, cup final, she will have a really big opportunity to make her mark on a team that, you know, by all, as much as Robert Villaham wants Grace Clinton to stay, it is most likely that she will return to Manchester United next season. So you have to think about who will be around next next year. And Binberg was brought for the future in, in January. She's a really young um, player. She's got a lot of learning to do, but I think she's got that talent and I think she performed really well and she got that assist for um, the second goal, I think. I think. And she showed her qualities. But Spurs did get two goals in, in quite quick succession and suddenly it was 2-1 and it seemed to be lasting and sticking at 2-1 for quite a while. I had an eye on this while I was at the Arsenal game. But you just felt like Manchester United were going to get the goal. Well, they you were, messaged me and said that Spurs were in sort of time managed, game seven, managed. 79 minutes the and they're in the bloody minutes. corner trying to, to waste time. What are you doing? And um, of course, Manchester United, an equaliser in injury time. It was like peak... Manchester United of last season um, and Mary Earps is up there as well Shafeka she went up to to try and uh, help out I suppose and actually it was there's a great celebration of her running down the pitch with her fists in the air I do think Tottenham will be again frustrated at that I know they were distracted by Rachel Williams hitting the bar the header off the corner and it sort of created a, a mayhem but there were two Tottenham players on the line alongside Mary Letizia I think they will be frustrated that they can somehow keep it up. To be fair, I'd be distracted by Rachel Williams too. You're in injury time. You're It's 2-1 to you and Rachel Williams is in the box. I'd be like, everyone mark her. Forget everybody, like everybody else. Um, but it was Mayla Tizier who reacted quickest. Yeah. She also just signed a new contract. Yeah, and which, had her birthday. So oh, 22, so. lovely. So I'm sure Man United fans Super would be week. delighted. Um, one downside, Martha Thomas went off injured, which is a bit of a concern. That is a concern. I think she was holding her. It looked like she was holding her hamstring, so... Fingers crossed it's not too bad because they definitely need her for the cup final. I think especially since he is kind of shifting around his team a bit, you know, you mentioned Jess Nas is playing more centrally and I think that's a really good position for her. She's got that really direct running. Um, uh, Martha Thomas is playing in that 10 role and then you've got England out on the right mm. side, which is probably not where we're used to seeing her, but she, Beth and England will always work hard for the team. So, um, And she's incredibly, you know, full of energy and fit as well. So I think um, he's trying to find the solution to having to mix his team up a bit. Yeah, I mean, they've pretty much consolidated six spot now. The result has made it no easier to figure out who's going to win this FA Cup final. Um, I'd still probably give the edge, obviously, to Manchester United. They've been there before. I think that experience is going to play a huge part. So all the more intriguing, though, the fact that neither team actually managed to get up. Well, that's the thing. Do you remember just before the Cup fin- County Cup final? And as soon as Chelsea... Heavily beat Arsenal at Stamford Bridge. I was like, Arsenal are the favourites. And I do, for this one, it's a draw, so, you know. Manchester United are obviously the favourites, but I do think, yeah, it's we'll going to be interesting. We'll ask the rabbit. Um, okay, moving on to the other side of Manchester. Manchester City, 5, West Ham, nil. A goal in 40 seconds for Lele Ohabi. Um, West Ham forgot to start marking. I don't know. They forgot to start the game, it seemed like. They were asleep for the first 25 minutes or so. Um, Manchester City started on the front foot. Seriously, Lauren Hemp was causing all sorts of problems. Bunny Shaw then got a goal in the third minute. A a wonderful goal. Like, took it down on her chest and put it in the roof of the net with two defenders around her. That's 20 WSL goals now for her. 50 goals in the WSL for her, the second quickest player. The 50th re- was her second one. Yeah, oh, sorry. But she did get 50 WSL goals now, but it's, she's the second quickest player to get that, um, to reach that yeah. uh, behind Viv Miedema. So incredible from her. But just the start from West Ham, it, it was couldn't terrible. get going. It was really, really bad. And I think it will really frustrate Rianne Skinner how, quick, uh, how slow they were to come out of the blocks. Because I think... Those two goals, while City are so efficient and brilliant at them, and you, but you know exactly what they're going to go do. They're going to go out to the wide and they're going to come in to Bunny Shaw, whoever's in the middle. And I think that's the most frustrating thing is that you need to make them work harder for their goals and you need to make them think a bit more rather than doing just, you know, what they are so good at doing. And they, they didn't do that at all. And their press was so slow and compared to cities who were on the defence as soon as they got the ball. City were so energetic and so they were just being able to control the ball in that first half. 
And at times it just felt like a relentless wave of city attacks as they were allowed to move almost unhindered up until the inside the centre line and then they could do what they wanted. Yeah, I think, as you say, frustrating and sometimes, again, scorelines maybe don't fully reflect the game because they were th- West Ham were 3-0 down very quickly. And from the 25th minute onward or so, they got they kind of switched on. It's like they realised what City were doing. They figured out a little bit what they needed to do. Um, I think they went to a, a back five. They, they at least tried to shore up that space down the width. Um, you know, Asai forcing Kiara Keating into a really good save, um, which was their first shot on target. Um, so they, they finished the first half definitely better than they started. They were better in the second half up until the 80th minute where there was two goals in quite quick succession. But they looked, you know, they hit the crossbar three times. They were better. I do think City knew they had the game won. Yes, that's so fair. That's, so while they did improve, and I do think that, yeah, I agree they completely they got, improved. They got shots. Um, I do think City were able at 3-0 to take the foot of the gats. And then obviously they lost Bunny Shore at yeah, half-time. Yeah, that would have played a, played a part. And that kind of changes the whole dynamic of that team. Yes, Lauren Hemp plays more centrally in that central role, but I think, you know, Bunny Shore is not just about the goals. It's about everything that she brings to that centre-forward position, whether she's dropping down deep and linking play, her press, her aerial ability, and they didn't have that in the second half as much. So... Um, I think it's going to be interesting. We don't, we haven't had it confirmed yet. What's what's happened to her? But um, I wouldn't be surprised if she is done. Catherine Batty did report that they think it might be worse than they thought it was. There's a fear it might be um, a break in the foot, and with the league potentially coming down to goal difference, that could be a massive blow for Manchester City. Yeah, and it's been. I've said it all season. Like I've said it on multiple different things. What happens if one of those front three or four get get injured? They don't have because. Gareth Taylor is so set on the consistency of his team. And I think the one change was, you know, kind of Jess Park coming in has been a revelation, but that was kind of only because Joe Rawdon yep. got injured. Mary Fowler also for Chloe Kelly has been the other change. Other than that, it's been pretty standard front three that you could pick mm-hmm. every week for the last season. And the problem, yeah, the pro- that's always the problem when you have such a set lineup what happens when something goes wrong, especially at the stage of the season. Um, worth pointing out that it was Laura Blinkilda Brown's first goal for the club. She came on and then Jess Park with the icing on the cake, a wonderful kind of solo move from her. She's, she's just been just so, so good. Amazing. Like, I just love watching her play so much and whether she's out on the wing setting up the first goal or she's running through the middle with her tricky feet. Do you know she um, reminds me a little bit of, because this is very high praise and she's not quite there yet, but I do get flashes of Bon Matty that kind of light on her feet that can kind of dance through when two players come together and she somehow gets through yes, the middle right. with the ball. There's little flashes here and there. Where it's, it's just, just how the ball sticks magic. to her feet and her confidence as well and her uh, her knowledge and her own ability to, to know what she wants to do. And I know Gareth Taylor's aim for her was to start being more productive in front of goal. She certainly bought that <laughs> another goal this time round and she seems to be absolutely loving her football at the moment so um, yeah well, really really key a good day for Manchester City 13th straight league win which is a record dominant 18 shots 13 on target which is incredible um, so yeah they will be absolutely delighted with that they've given themselves a bit of a cushion goal difference wise puts more pressure onto Chelsea who have their game midweek next week um, so should they get the win it'll be all down to goals Um Right, I was at Arsenal Leicester. So Arsenal 3 Leicester 0 at the Emirates. 42,000 fans there for that one, which was brilliant. Um, and with this win, Arsenal have secured Champions League spot. They've secured that, that third spot. Um, but yeah, the final time at the Emirates for Arsenal this season, over 300,000 fans have turned out at the main stadium for the Gunners across the season, which is incredible. Um, they built really, something really special. Yeah, it was really interesting. As are other clubs, but they're building something really special. Right. I was just adding that. Okay, we're good. Uh, a very interesting lineup as well because a lot of Wubin Moy wasn't in the starting lineup. Um, Steph Catley was put into that centre back role and actually had a really really good game. Um, it was intriguing to see how she was going to do there. So she was she was great in that in the back line. Um, really impressed with her. Made some really good driving runs forward as well. Her the balls she was picking out were excellent. Um, not to say that Leicester didn't have their opportunities. I thought their first half they did really well. In the first half they knew the game plan, they stuck to the game plan, and um, Mamiki forcing Zinsberger into she a brilliant was superb, save. Wasn't she? Yeah, she like, was so good. There was that save, that first save of her, and then she just sort of floats across the field and 
sometimes I don't think the midfielders can really understand where she is or, or catch up with her and it allows her to kind of pull the strings in that area. Yeah. Um, I mean, Arsenal still were definitely the dominant team. You know, they're really trying to stretch that Leicester defence, trying to find the gaps. You felt it was coming. Um, and, and I think the passing move to then unlock Leicester um, for that Beth Mead goal was wonderful. Yeah, it was superb. It was Caitlin Ford with the assist in the end, a lovely through ball. And it was a really instinctive finish from, from Beth Mead. But it was a, a series of maybe four or five passes just before that that led to the goal. And it, it kind of sent the Leicester defenders into a bit of a spin, I guess. And they didn't quite know where Beth Mead was and it allowed her to get that space. Um, Sam Tierney also had an opportunity also pulled another good save from Zinsberger it was lovely to hear the crowd every time she made those big saves and even Zinsberger herself was like, it was like she'd scored a goal um, she's great at that yeah she? yeah yeah she's uh, good vibes um, Emily Fox was superb I thought as well for Arsenal she actually picked up the players uh, the club's player of the match when I was watching it back um, you sent me while I was at Lewis you sent me a message saying Emily Fox with a perfect that kind of Italian yeah. you know that and I was watching it back and it was that shot, wasn't it, where she shot on goal and it was saved uh, by Lise Cock. And I think it was that. It was that. Inspired the, the run and the shot. From I, distance. I think it was that. But there was also a moment where the ball went back behind her and she, the, I think the attacker was ahead of her and she somehow kind of got back and kind of almost half on the ground swung around and got the ball away from the defence. And it was that kind of movement and suddenly she turned it into an attack and it was just like, whoa. Um, yeah, well, I've said it before, but she is a, a true right back. And I think sometimes, especially this season, Arsenal have had to try different things at right back because Noah Moritz went off to Aston Villa and Laura uh, Bean Morto is coming back from ACL. So they've had to try and not, they've had to put Katie McCabe back mm-hmm. there. It's, she can play there, but it's not her natural position, right? So um, I think the fact that they've got a real, like, proper right back, a really exciting right back who is incredible on the ball and defensively, and but also her surging runs forward. And she has a, a really good strike on her as well. Yeah, so, um, she's very something exciting. Something to be really excited about. Yeah, she's settled in really well as well. Um, so, yeah, I think the second half, I feel like Leicester lost their way a little bit. I spoke to Sam Tierney and to Jen Foster afterwards, and they both kind of touched on the fact that they just kind of lost the game plan a little bit um, during the second half and they weren't doing really what they were supposed to be doing and Arsenal capitalised on that. Um, a lovely Russo goal and another Beth Mead goal. The Beth, Beth Mead said she thought the keeper would be very happy with her with that finish because um, Kopp had made a brilliant save off Russo, a real instinctive point blank save and then it ended up bobbling across to Beth Mead who just very easily <laughs> slotted home. Can I just talk about that Steph Catley run? Yeah, Russo's please. Because she charged out. Yeah, the that's what I mean about the won the ball runs. in midfield, kept going, just kept running and then set up Russo for the goal. I just thought it was a really surging, it was like, I'm going on an adventure. You know that gift. <laughs> yes. She's like, I know I don't want to do this when I'm on the left, but I can do it while I'm in the middle too. Um, and it was a great finish as well from Russo, a really tight angle. Um, like, not a tight angle, but like for her, she turned it. It was a really like short shot, if you know yeah. what I mean. Um, it was a good finish from her. Uh, also positive that we saw both Manum and Miedema back on the pitch. Lovely reception for both of them. Um, Giannis Ida will have been a little bit cagey about whether we'd see them in the uh, on the bench or not. But not only did they were they on the bench, they also came back and both played. And at one point, Manum almost set up Miedema and it would have been the most incredible return 2.0 um, but it was not to be but I think the most important thing is they've got European football and yes. if you look at the way the season has gone there'll be a lot of disappointment in that Arsenal squad but getting a trophy and getting European football is the minimum of what they would have wanted it's what they did last season um, and it gives them a chance to you know some of the players will be going to the Olympics but some of them will have a, a good rest over the summer come back in September for the first round of the Champions League in a in a bit of a different place to where they were last year, where people, the players had had, you know, five days of training off the World Cup mm-hmm. or something. So I think it's, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how they get on. I'll be interested to see as well. There's players out of contract and stuff in the summer. So it'll be really interesting to see um, who they manage to hang on to. But all in all, um, a good day for Arsenal, especially gaining that, ensuring that Champions League spot. Um, it does mean the table looks like this. Man City are back on top. 19 matches played, 49 points and 42 goal difference. Chelsea are in second with 18 matches played, 46 points and a 39 goal difference. Um, So three in it. And Arsenal have nabbed that final Champions League spot with 19 games played and 43 points. As Iona said, 
they are prepared for any potential slip. He spoke about how important it is to be prepared for the slips. He said, you can't control them. He gave a really good analogy about that famous Australian speed skater who was expected to come last and everyone fell in front of him and he won. And he said, you basically need to be ready prepared. and prepared for anyone to slip. You so. keep laughing at me when I say this, but I actually can see them finishing second. That's fine. That's all right. You've said it here and now you'll be vindicated if they do. <laughs> um, United and Liverpool are tied on 32 points, but United are in fourth spot due to goal difference. Sadly, nothing has changed at the bottom. Bristol are still rooted down there on six points and West Ham on 13. So as we said, if they do not pick up a result at the weekend, Bristol City will be relegated, unfortunately. Um, moving on now to the championship. Results are as follows. Blackburn Rovers 1, Watford 0. Reading 1, Durham 0. Birmingham City 1, Sheffield 0. Uh, Southampton 3, London City Lionesses 1, Sunderland 0, Charlton 1 and Lewis 0, Palace 2. So you were at that game, we'll get to it. Um, Palace sit top on 45 points with a plus 35 goal difference. Charlton sit in second on 42 points with a plus 13 goal difference. So points wise, you know, there's one game left. Charlton still could win the league, right? But some magical miracle will have to happen because they will need a 23 goal swing. Or So they would need, they'd need to beat Southampton. <laughs> one. Palace would need to lose to Sunderland. Two. And the goal swing would have to be 23 goal goal swing. So most likely, <laughs> lads, uh, Crystal Palace <laughs> are going up, um, which is very exciting for them. You were there for that, but they won't be picking up that trophy until the weekend at Selhurst Park. Um, which you'll also be at. Which you'll also be at. Um, Sunderland's title push is over. Um, they sit in third on 40 points, while Southampton are currently fourth on 39 points. So the, the kind of four horse race, it was a five horse race for a long time. The four horse race lasted right up until the second last weekend, which is pretty good, right? We're glad no one pulled away too early. Um, it does mean, though, that loss for Lewis, sadly, that they have, their relegation has been confirmed. So both Watford and Lewis um, are being relegated this season. Watford um, sitting in 12th on 12 points and Lewis in 11th on 16 points. And you were there um, at that match. So it was Rianne Cleverly from Lewis who said at the end, only Lewis, only Lewis can turn a funeral into a party. And it was a big day. It was a special day. And I think it's kind of very apt for what they built at that club and they had um I know it was very emotional the fact that they've gone down and that's going to really hurt them all for a long time and I spoke to Scott Booth after the game and he was understandably really upset and he's leaving uh he's leaving at the end of the season as is Maggie Murphy and I spoke to him and I you know I know it's my job but you can't help but hate doing those interviews because it's really really tough to try and get lines out of managers who are clearly heartbroken at what, what's just happened on the pitch. I think it was just one step too far from them against a Palace team who have been completely dominant this season. Of all teams in terms of I know the championship has been wild, but the way that they scored goals and you know, they looked so good. So they had fifty five goals. Yeah, so they they just looked so good on, on Sunday and he said he said after the game, you know, in all of the other games we've been in the game and we I felt we've had a chance in this one it was the one game this season where I felt we, we, we just, there was, you know, their yeah. quality was just too much. Yeah. Um, but after the game, they let all the supporters onto the pitch. The oh. kids were running around, the dogs were running around, <laughs> um, playing ball. The and the rounds was Lou's in his mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was just like, it's that kind of proper community, vibe. community vibes. You know, they are about Lewis and they're very, very key, like their core is about where they're from. And the people that they come come and watch the club, and to get two thousand six hundred, I think, in it was a, re a a league high for them attendance, and to get that kind of numbers in, not many clubs would do that for a, a team who are almost certainly about to go down. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a really nice way for them to say goodbye to the championship, um, as Rianne cleverly said, um, ch turning a funeral into a party. Um, I think that's quite the perfect way of something. Like yes, that. and also a. Massive hat tip to Maggie Murphy, who is leaving Lewis as well. I hope please she has don't a bit of a break. Us. Don't leave us entirely. <laughs> Have a break. You deserve it, but please stay in the game because we need um, you. it definitely needs you. Okay, fine. We'll talk about Champions League. <laughs> Everyone's doing it. Um, <laughs> we were in Barcelona. Estadio Olimpico. Beautiful stadium, by the way. Oh, such a nice stadium. One of my best stadiums I've been in. Okay, it's massive, first of all. Feckin' huge. 
Um, so for the fans, they were quite far away from the pitch. But I mean, I mean that in the sense of like just a pure like beauty awe of it and grandeur. Beauty of it. Like the front of it was like classic Spanish building vibes. It was so pretty. It was up high and on a on a mountain kind of side of a hill, if you like, overlooking. Barcelona. It's a big complex as well, so there's other wonderful buildings but around. You stand, it. you stand in it, you just immediately feel small, and it's yes. just like. And also, when the sun is out and the grass is that green, and the red and blue of Barcelona is waving, it just the colors, the vibrancy, everything is is pops. so cool. Pops. It looks great. And um, Chelsea, of course, historic win over Barcelona, and we don't want to go too big on it because we know it's only half time. <laughs> But it is it's a big deal. Big. <laughs> it's a big deal. And it's hard because, you know, I guess as players and managers, you can't really celebrate it too much because it doesn't mean anything. You know, it is halftime. You haven't got through to the final yet. But it is a massive thing to achieve. The tactics were absolutely bang on from Emma Hayes. Um, and to beat Barcelona for the first time at home since February 2019 was the last time Barcelona lost a home match is an incredible feat. Yeah. Um, and we'll celebrate it. I think they... You know when you went to but I didn't get to go to Barcelona last year. Yes. For the one one draw. But I think they came away from that feeling hard done by in a way and that their effort that they put into that game deserved a bit more than what they got. And I think they took that day and they used that this time round. And I think every 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 ounce of energy was used to by the players to go into this game. No matter how tired they they're feeling at the moment or how many games they've got in the legs. I think playing Barcelona in that stadium with a point to prove, um, knowing that they've kind of been the the nemesis for this team for the last couple of years mm-hmm. anyway. And I think that just gave them extra am- ammunition to go out and perform. And, you know, it, you just, you saw it by the fact that they just didn't stop running. Every player just didn't stop running. I don't know how they did it. There was that moment in the, I think, the final 10 minutes where Jess Carter, who was absolutely phenomenal, um, best player on the pitch and that's saying something because there were quite a few standout performances but the, the Barcelona played another ball through and she sprinted back with everything she had to, to try and clear it and turned around to her teammates and was like please help me kind of I should like this like she'd um because they were just expending every ounce of energy on that field. It must be so hard when you don't have the ball and to be in the mindset that you need to be comfortable knowing you're not going to have the ball. As you said there was some really standard performances Lawrence and Charles on the left marshalled Caroline Graham Hansen really well which is a bloody hard thing to do because she is one of the best in the world as you said Carter superb Nuskin and Cuthbert in midfield had a great game and Leupold's I thought Ramirez was really good it was a bloody hard job she was doing but her hold up play she had opportunities she could have scored could have made it 2-0 to Chelsea should have scored um, and one of my players of the season Chelsea for me Chelsea's player of the season is Johanna Wright and Canarid she was playing that kind of wing back position probably a little bit unnatural for her to be so deep but her engine allowed her to get yeah. up the pitch and cause problems I think I think the thing is like that system really played to their strengths at this moment of, in time and they knew exactly what Barcelona were going to do you know it's not a surprise how Barcelona play they play how they play and it's on you to try and stop them but it, it and that doesn't take away from how good they are but they are Barcelona and they don't really change it up that much um, so, so you don't need to, generally. but I th- so if you can nullify mm-hmm. the threats, and I think every player, you know, Jess Carter, I do think performs best in the back three rather yeah. than the back two. I think that really we saw at the World Cup for England is where she really shone for England in that in that lineup. And Neve Charles was a <laughs> I've never seen her play left centre back before. I don't think, but I think the fact that she doubled up with Lawrence and it allowed Lawrence to go forward and mm-hmm. try and exploit that width on the wings. But it also meant that if Caroline Graham Hansen got past Lawrence and there was a backup in Neve Charles who knows how to play that kind of role uh, role at fullback. So um, there was always that extra player. And then down the other side, as you say, uh, JRK was absolutely full of running. I think in the first half, they had more joy. Yes. So they turned over the ball quite a lot in that first half. And there was particular space down the wings because they crowded that central mm-hmm. area out. So it gave them time to run. They could have been maybe more clinical with that in moments. Um, but and then they had to. They knew that Boston were come, going to come out second half, and they had to kind of dig in, dig the heels in, and defend the lead. But we said it before when they played Manchester United, and Manchester United took the lead, or when West Ham took the lead against Arsenal. When you have something to defend, 
it gives you that much more ammunition to go and defend it. Yeah, and I will say it's not like Chelsea had one chance and they took it and that was it and they sat back and defended. They had multiple opportunities. They should have won it 2-0 and they can take that with them into the second leg. Back at the bridge, 27,000 tickets sold, 30,000 tickets sold already. So it keeps, now, it keeps going up. That was this morning. I think it's even gone up more, which is brilliant yeah. um, because they want to fill out that stadium. Um, they want it to be noisy. It was bloody noisy in a Stadio Olimpico. My God, do the Spanish love to whistle and jeer. And I actually think it played into Chelsea's hands. Maybe it didn't have the desired effect, I don't think. Um, I think Barcelona got very, very frustrated. Yes, and I think there is an element of Barcelona didn't play great. And part of that is down to the fact that Chelsea made it really hard for them to play well. But they also did get frustrated. Um, and as Emma Hayes said, you sometimes just need a little bit of luck. And that happened when Alexio Pateas missed with the pra- practically the last kick of the of the game on this in the penalty spot practically but there was just a, the goalkeeper to be if there was any player I could choose to put on the end of that ball kind of unmarked Alexia Puteus would be up, what, right up there and I I still don't know how she'd send it away. But I as I say you I've always said you, you earn your luck. And they certainly did that. They did. Well, um, it's very exciting. I'm very excited about Saturday. I'm really looking forward to it. And um, you said they needed to keep it tight. And my God, they've done exactly what they needed to do. Um, And it's worth pointing out that during all of this excitement, it was announced that Anne-Catherine Berger, AKB, is off to Gotham FC. She's leaving Chelsea after five years, numerous trophies, some incredible memories, probably one of the OG stalwart goalkeepers. When you think of some of the best goalkeepers in the Barclays WSL, she is up there. Yeah, it's all a bit weird that she goes right now. Yeah, it's sad. It's this weird system, you know, because we can't sell, we can't do transfers in the league at this point in time, but the NWSL can come in and, and buy a player Sweet. if they want in. Yoink. And I know she was at the end of her contract and Chelsea probably also wanted a bit of money for her and I'm sure Gotham offered up some money for her to take her at this particular point. So, um yeah, it's, it's a bit of a weird ending to a brilliant career at Chelsea and a brilliant career in the WSL. She's been, for many years, the best or one of the best keepers in this league. And um, it's going to be sad not to see her, but there's been so many memories. Yeah, sad, sad Chelsea fans didn't get to say goodbye to her as well, which is a shame. But hopefully we'll see her when we go to Gotham. In the and and I'm, I'm sure she will be back to say goodbye. Yeah, hopefully. hopefully. Um, we do have to touch on the other semi-final because... Holy shit. Um, PSG were leading Lyon 2 0 up until the 80th minute. And then, literally, in the time that it took us to find a restaurant and sit down and order our food, whipped out my phone. Eight minutes later, it's 3 2 to Lyon. Absolutely bonkers. Um, and as you kept saying, if any team is going to have some sort of chaotic end to a game and lose <laughs> a lead like that, it'll be PSG. Yes. So it makes the second leg it's all very, more exciting. It's very standard. PSG. God knows how that's going to end. It's going to be another wild one. So have an eye on that one as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. So f- we've come to it. Oh Christ. The moment of the week. And I bet you haven't thought about it since I mentioned it in the intro. Well, no, I've been talking, haven't I? My come brain, on. brain's been operating on other things. I think I will go. I mean, the Chelsea win was pretty special. Pretty special, wasn't it? Pretty special. But I'm going to go obscure, maybe. Ooh. And I would want you all to go and watch Sinead Hopcroft's goal for Crystal Palace. It was the opening goal against Lewis. I have not hit someone hit. See, I'm not. Let's try that again. You haven't heard? <laughs> hit? <laughs> you haven't seen? I have not seen someone hit a ball that sweetly for a long time. Okay. The the dink over the defender, she said, I interviewed her after the game, she said, oh, well, it just bounced kindly for me. It was a lot more to it than Come that. On. And it, it kind of nestled, out, just looped agonisingly over Sophie Whitehouse. It was outstretched in the goal. So go and watch that one. There you go, guys. Homework for you, which I'm sure you'd absolutely love to hear. Go and watch that goal. And while you're at it, subscribe. Give us a like. Leave a comment if you fancy it. We're on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcasts, of course. There's a little plug there. Lots of homework this week. Um, Coming up this weekend, we have got Chelsea's big game on Saturday at Stamford Bridge, which we will be at. Then I'm at Spurs versus Brighton. And so you are going to watch, hopefully, Palace lifting a trophy. Yes, I will be at Selhurst, but it's the on for a record crowd, I think. It's going to be a big um, day in South East London and I'm very excited. Well, plenty to look forward to, and we will, of course, cover it on next week's episode, ideally coming to you on Monday next week. Um, But as ever, thank you for tuning in, and we will chat to you very soon.